So here we have the analogy, right? This is what most uh, students who study economics are taught, and Ross Perot, I think, uh, deserves a lot of credit for the fact that people think in these terms today, or blame, as the case may be. Um, Ross Perot told us early on, just like the government, every American has to live within his means. And President Obama has told us that the government is out of money. So what is the basis for this household government analogy? The household clearly has a budget constraint. And we also teach that in our economics classes. Microeconomics teaches students how to maximize utility subject to some constraint. Face a budget constraint. Hey, how much money can you spend? You can spend everything you receive, either working or unearned in some capacity, gifts, interest, earnings, whatever it is, after taxes, plus everything you can borrow. That's what you can spend. And when it comes to buying things in the United States, there's really only one way to make final payment. When you purchase something, at the end of the day, the only way to pay for it is with the government's money. There is no other way. How does that work? And so here's an example. Suppose that you go out to dinner and you purchase your meal with your Visa card. Is that the final payment? No. Right? You get a bill in the mail from Visa. And what do you do? You write them a check. Is that the final payment? Well, maybe the last time you see anything happen, but it's not the final payment. At the end of the day, Visa doesn't want your check. It doesn't want what you've written down. What it wants is a credit to its bank account, and that happens as that check goes through a clearing process and Visa's bank account is credited with reserves. What are bank reserves? Government IOUs, Federal Reserve money, government money. Only the government's money can discharge a payment as a final means of payment, okay? We are the users of the government's currency. In contrast, the government is the issuer of its currency. It is not like a household, okay? It doesn't have to raise money by borrowing or collecting taxes in order to spend. Those of us in the private sector have to earn or borrow dollars before we can spend. The government must spend first. Okay, we say this and sometimes people have a hard time understanding that. How can the government spend first? How can it not spend first? How could the government collect taxes in dollars first? It first had to have spent those dollars into existence. Right? The spending has to come before the payment or collection of taxes. The government must spend first. Government spending is not, we use this term a lot, operationally constrained by revenues. It doesn't need tax payments and um, bond sales in order to fund itself. It is not operationally constrained. The only relevant constraints are self-imposed constraints. We talked a little bit about this earlier, things like debt ceilings. Okay, that's a self-imposed constraint. Uh, rules that prevent the Treasury from running an overdraft in its account at the Fed. That's a self-imposed constraint, right? It is a uh, constraint that is imposed by Congress. Rules that prevent the Fed from buying Treasury bonds directly from the Treasury, so-called monetizing the debt. It's a self-imposed constraint. How does the government actually spend? It spends by writing checks on its account at the Federal Reserve Bank. What we see and what we hear all the time is that the government is spending 100, taxes are 90, and it sells bonds equal to 10. So what we see is an attempt to coordinate the government's spending with taxes and bond sales, and it creates the illusion that what's happening is that the government is taking money from us and using it to pay for the things that it purchases. Okay, but that's not really what's going on. As Warren um, likes to say the government neither has nor does not have any money at any point in time. It is simply the scorekeeper. So what happens when the government spends? Let's suppose make it up. Okay, this is Ben Bernanke in an interview on 60 Minutes uh, just last year when uh, Pelly asked him, is that tax money the Fed is spending? And Bernanke says, it's not tax money. The banks have accounts at the Fed, much the way uh, that you do have an account at a commercial bank. So when we want to lend to a bank, we simply use the computer to mark up the size of the account they have with the Fed. 
It's exactly like putting points on the screen at the baseball game. Okay? They just mark up the balance. I don't know of a single example of a currency crisis or a debt default by a sovereign government that has issued obligations in its own currency when it has flexible exchange rates and a non-convertible currency. I don't know of one. Okay? The U.S. can control its currency and therefore, by implication, its economic destiny. There is a relationship between the power the state has in the monetary sphere and the power that it can exert in the political policy sphere. There is no revenue constraint for governments that control the money that sits at the top of the hierarchy. Does that mean that we should spend without limit? No. No. Emphatically no. Right? As the economy recovers, spending will need to be regulated to prevent inflation. But I would argue, and I think what we're all here to argue today, is that it's time to stop allowing the monetary system to limit our range of policy options. It is causing unnecessary human suffering, and it's time for us to begin to recognize the advantages of a modern monetary system. Thank you.